I know what you're all thinking. It's gone half past seven and he hasn't started yet. So I, I shall start. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Chris Sellen. I'm the guy that's been sending out all those emails to you, uh, confirming your bookings and so on. And, and a very, very warm welcome to this, our, our third CBA Wessex uh, Spring Lecture for 2021. Uh, it has to be the third because it's almost summer, as you can tell from the weather. Uh, and I understand tomorrow's weather is going to be really summer like. Anyway, a very good evening to you. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping before I hand over to Gavel for tonight's talk. Um, basically, we are using Zoom meeting, which uh, many of you are, are aware of and, and hate or love or whatever. Um, we're using that rather than a Zoom webinar, one, because it's, it's cheaper, um, and two, because we think it gives a little bit more immediacy for the speakers and, and the people running the show. So um, I hope you'll agree with, with us as we, as we go through. I've asked you to mute your sound and also turn off your video. There's a number of reasons for this. Uh, the main one is that we've got quite a few people on this call tonight and it will be using up an awful lot of bandwidth if we had everyone's picture uh, available. Um, so this means you get a, a, a better view of people. We don't get any jerky movements or the screen breaking up and so on. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is because there are so many people, it's quite actually quite difficult to manage uh, questions, which I think Gav will be quite happy to take at the end. Um, it's difficult to manage if, if people are turning on and off their screen and so on. So what we will be doing as far as questions is concerned is um, asking you to use the chat function, which we'll use at the end. Um, this will enable you to sort of ask your question and I will manage it and ask the question on your behalf, which means we don't get any duplication or, or things like that. Uh, so that's the way it's going to run. Um, the other thing I need to mention is we are recording this for uh, later screening if possible, um, but I don't think that's going to impact a lot of people because you won't be able to see your pictures. So. Uh, so that's fair enough. So we're recording. Um, I think that's it. I just want to remind you that the best view, if you if you want the best experience out of Zoom meeting, is to use the on a view button, which you should have. Uh, use the speaker view. I think there's a speaker side by side, which tends to give us the best view. And once you're into that, I think there's also a second option, which allows you to select the full screen which means you don't get any other videos, just the speaker and the presentation. So uh, I suggest you use that. So that's the housekeeping done. Uh, I fed up with my voice already. So um, without further ado, I will ask uh, Claire Mayo to uh, come into the conversation because she's the, the secretary of CBA Wessex uh, and she's going to introduce uh, our talk this evening. So thanks very much. And over to you, Claire. Thank you very much, Chris. It gives me great pleasure this evening to welcome you to the third lecture in the CBA Wessex Spring Series. If you don't know us, we are a registered charity, part of the CBA family. And as a charity, we play an active role in preserving and enhancing heritage within Wessex. We look forward to getting back to our pre-COVID activities. It's uh, been a long time coming. Um, these activities include walks, lectures, study days, and of course, conference. Should you choose to join us, you are most welcome. Membership is open to everyone. And you can find us online at cba-wessex.org.uk. The region of Wessex covers Wiltshire, Hampshire, Dorset, Isle of Wight, Channel Islands and Berkshire. And it is to the very edge of Berkshire near the town of Marlow that we go this evening for the location of our site. Marlow is my hometown. So last year when I heard that a key archaeological discovery had been made on my doorstep that could change our understanding of southern Anglo-Saxon Britain, I was not only incredibly excited but I wanted to know an awful lot more. So therefore I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our speaker Dr Gabor Thomas this evening as he's going to share with us his provisional reflections on the Marlow warlord an early medieval burial of the Middle Thames. Welcome, Gabor. Thank you, Claire. I'm, I'm just going to share my uh, PowerPoint. So 
thanks for inviting me to speak about this uh, relatively recent discovery. Um, basically, I mean, you may, uh, I think, well, I hope um, you may have heard or picked up on this discovery um, last autumn, autumn 2020, when um, there was quite a lot of media coverage um, based on it. And, and I was really surprised um, at the level at which the media really ran with this story. Um, I think it had lots of ingredients that I'm going to be covering today that, that really um, made it appealing to, to the media. It had metal detectorists, of course it had, um, it had a, a juicy burial um, a, of a warrior, weaponry, um, but I think that's something had, it's also to do with timing. I, I don't think there was, <laughs> it was during lockdown. Um, also, we were going into, I think, the second lockdown at the time, and there wasn't a great amount happening. But that was that was really to my to to, to our benefit because, um, you know, that that media coverage really helped um, to um, generate a lot of interest in the find beyond the locality, and that had lots of uh, benefits to us, including uh, at the time we were running a, a crowdfunding campaign to generate funds for the conservation program. So that that really did help. I use the word um, provisional in my title because, um, you know, there's still a lot of uh, research and analysis to be conducted on this burial. Um, the, the grave goods have just come out of um, conservation. Um, there is still plenty of ongoing analysis to do in, in relation to the skeletal remains at the University of um, Reading and also um, spin-off analyses of various types, so genetic profiling, isotope profiling, and so forth. So that all remains to be done. So I can only really give you uh, an, a, prov a provisional account at, at this stage, but nonetheless, I hope it gives you enough to um, you know, get, gain a sort of clear sense of the significance of this find and, and, and some, of the, some of the questions that um, he allows us to address. Um, just, just a sort of a, uh, an, another point, really an introductory point, is I'm going to be relatively vague on the, the fine spot itself. I mean, we've heard from Claire that it's um, close to the um, Buckinghamshire um, town of, of, uh, uh, um, of Marlow. It was actually found on the Berkshire side of the river, however, and this is just to preserve the anonymity of the site. Uh, with, that's one of the agreements that I've had with the landowner. Um, um, just to sort of prevent um, night hawking and, and that kind of thing. But those of you that are familiar with this stretch of the Thames will probably be able to locate it fairly precisely um, from just the, 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 the images. It's a very prominent site um, overlooking a pretty majestic sweep of the Middle Thames with extensive view sheds um, you know, over, over, the, over the valley and, and neighbouring territories. So it's a very prominent um, and dramatic site. And that's um, one of the key sort of aspects um, of the burial. And also just to say that um, although he was found on the Berkshire side, um, the long-term future of this particular discovery will be, or the long-term home, will be um, Buckinghamshire. Um, the, the, the objects and the burial are going to um, form centrepiece for a new early medieval gallery opening um, in um, Aylesbury Museum um, later this year. And that's just uh, that you might, because you're asking why, why, why that particular museum, why Buckinghamshire? Really, it's a bit of a historical accident. Um, at, time of the, 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 the initial finds from this burial uh, made by detectorists ended up there because of um, the involvement of a fine liaison officer from Buckinghamshire. And they had, and, 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 and through that, um, it was made known that the, that the, the gallery was, 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 was being um, scoped at that time. And these finds fitted perfectly into that. So they, they, they were really eager to acquire um, um, the grave goods and, and they, they, the, 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 the objects found subsequent to that in our excavations will end up there also. So it's great that it will have a, a long-term home and actually go on display. Um, that's, that, that's really important, I think. 
So I'm gonna, my talk's gonna really be divided into, into three parts. Um, first of all, I'm gonna talk about the, um, the background to this find in terms of um, discovery and excavation. Um, in the second part, I'm just going to review um, what was found in terms of the, the, the constituents of the grave, um, and the grave goods themselves. And finally, in the third part, I'm going to um, consider the wider context of the burial and its relevance to regional um, research agendas. And um, yeah, more than welcome to, to answer questions uh, at the end. So without further ado, that's sort of, let's see if I can move. Oh, there we go, yes. So discovery and excavation. So I think one of the many narratives that kind of, um, um, you know, is involved with this discovery is the, you know, some of the really important results that can come out of fruitful collaboration between metal detectorists and archeologists. So this discovery was initially made by um, a, a members of a local metal, detect, metal detecting club, the Maidenhead Searchers, on land that they had actually um, um, searched for, for, for several years, but until that point, with mo not much um, luck. Um, the, 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 the find was made in a very large field um, that previous to this particular visit back in 2000 and 18, autumn of, hadn't really produced much. And um, that all changed um, in the, the winter of that year when Sue Washington, who you can see on the left-hand side, got a very large signal, um, initially dismissed because it's the sort of signal that they typically get, typically get off um, large chunks of iron plowshares and things like that found in, 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 in the plow soil. But on further investigation, um, it was soon shown that there was actually something far more significant. Um, Sue so, um, investigated the signal and basically came on top of um, the rims of a pair of copper alloy bowls or vessels. Um, she immediately um, recognized that, that this was something of potential significance and being a responsible detectorist, she contacted the Fines Liaison Officer um, for Buckinghamshire um, and notified them of the find and said, well, basically, these, this discovery has been made very close to the surface. It's in, uh, quite vulnerable. Um, it's in the plough soil on um, agriculture land that is on current ag agricultural use. Um, um, I think this needs to be explored further. And then there was a small scale um, um, intervention by the Portable Antiquity Scheme, um, directed by Arwen Wood, the FLO for, for, for Buckinghamshire, um, and that basically um, just focused on the bowls and recovering the bowls um, within, a, uh, within a soil block. Um, so a kind of a mini excavation just to, to, to recover them. Um, it was very apparent that the bowls were in a fragile condition, um, they bore scars from being hit by the plough. Um, so it was quite a delicate operation. And in the process of cutting the soil block to recover the bowls, um, they uncovered a pair of iron spearheads. And this demonstrated um, pretty clearly that the likelihood was that this is a, an early medieval burial context that had um, been revealed at this particular site. Um, Arwen did a fantastic job of securing funding for the conservation of the bowls and the spearheads, by which time they're in Buckingham, um, Buckinghamshire Museum. And they were conserved and they were duly conserved. And you can see in the picture on the bottom right that actually um, with painstaking reconstruction and conservation, um, um, they're, 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 they're in remarkable condition. They have an excellent patina um, and the spearheads themselves are also in very good, good condition as well. Now, it just so happens that one of the key members of that particular metal detecting society, um, we see him um, on the front cover of the Searcher um, magazine, um, is somebody that had, has 
um, historically very close associations and work very closely um, with archaeologists. His name is James Mabber and he's been involved with some fairly high profile discoveries in the past, in, including um, you may have, have heard of the Watlington Horde, the Viking Age Horde uh, found in Watlington in Oxfordshire, which is now on display in Ashmolean Museum. He discovered that and worked very closely in the excavation and recovery of that particular find. Now, it was probably because he worked very closely with archaeologists that he felt he really needed to, um, that, that he, would, he, would, he would contact me um, in the department. Um, he tracked me down to the department as the early medievalist there. We had no prior contact um, before um, the, this, this particular discovery. And he, you know, he impressed on me, you know, he felt that it was important that you know, this burial was, it, was, it, was, was, was explored in its totality, potentially recovered in its totality because of its very shallow um, depth and because it was on, um, it's on um, agricultural land. I have to say when, when he initially um, sort of, um, you, you know, pitched the, this, this project to me, I was very reluctant. Um, I mean, I'm keenly aware of how expensive and complex um, post-excavation programs based on, on, on Anglo-Saxon cemeteries and burials can be, um, and not having any sort of um, funding in place to, to, to conduct um, um, further work on this, on a burial looked as though it could be quite richly furnished. I was, I was, I was, I was quite hesitant. Um, I think the compromise that was reached um, was that I felt, well, I think I, I, I basically I, th I felt that we needed a staged approach here. We've got one isolated burial, but you know, a whole series of unanswered questions. Is it part of a more extensive cemetery? Um, what's happening in the broader landscape? Um, so I convinced him that we needed to undertake um, wider work um, on this site. We needed to undertake geophysics and we needed to do a sort of broader scheme of evaluation just to understand the context of the burial better. So um, we undertook a magnetometry survey um, using our in-house uh, expertise and technician, Rob Fry at the department at the University of Reading um, in spring um, of 2000 and, get this right, 2019. And you can see the results of the, ge the, the magnetometry um, just here. Um, and they they looked initially quite promising actually i mean when we when we first reviewed the the results and you might be able to see um a series of sort of you know this dispersed um um spread of blob like features across the area the burials located approximately where my mouse is now hovering um some of these um, splodges looked remarkably reminiscent of uh, early medieval sunken featured buildings. Um, some looked very regular and appeared to have kind of sort of squared corners. So that immediately to me, um, you know, um, looked as these looked like these anomalies looked as though they were worth exploring. Um, and with this in mind, um, you know, we went to the landowner, went back to the landowner and with a view to doing targeted test excavation um, in the summer of 2020, um, focusing really on these on the geophysical anomalies um, to try and uh, understand um, the extent to which they bore any relationship to, 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 the, to the site of the burial. Um, so that's what we, we that's what we spent our time doing at least initially for um, the, the sort of um, two week, um, excavation um, that we that, that we agreed with the landowner. So initially looking at those geophysical anomalies, particularly those splodges, trying to sort of determine um, their significance. Um, I must say that it was a it was an interesting time in which to conduct a, an excavation, um, August 2020, um, during the pandemic. Um, I realised that a lot of commercial companies have managed uh, in archaeology the continued continued operations throughout the throughout the pandemic but for a, a university department it, it was uh, um, it felt quite unusual and novel um, we had to go to quite some extent to get the risk assessment passed 
Um, I should say that, you know, the University of Reading normally has quite large scale um, um, field school projects, particularly Silchester, uh, running in, in the summer, but they were all cancelled. So in the end, this quite small scale excavation was the only one running out of the department that, that summer. And, and for that reason, it was quite provided valuable experience for Reading students. It's quite a small team, um, a mixture of, of Reading undergraduates and also volunteers, local volunteers from um, a number of the societies that are active um, in this particular, this particular region. So um, what the, I guess the first week of digging demonstrated quite clearly is, is, is the anomalies that, that potentially that looked of interest on the geophysics, as is often the case, turn out to be, um, have nothing to do with, you know, the real focus of this, this site, the chronological sort of, the, the main sort of chronological sort of period of interest. Um, some turned out to be um, just, um, you know, geological um, features. We're on chalk here, but with, you know, pockets of clay with flints, and, and that I think, I think was partly responsible for some of these an anomalies. Um, others did turn out to be genuinely archaeological, but much later in date. Um, we've got a series of medieval quarry pits um, for extraction of flint, um, and, you know, for use, of, for, use, for use in building down in the valley below. Um, where flint is used extensively for construction of the medieval buildings there. So um, we soon recognised that actually um, there wasn't really much of a wider context um, to the burial, certainly surviving um, in, 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 in the landscape. It did look genuinely, in other words, to be um, a, an isolated interment, or at the very most, part of a very spatially restricted cluster of burials on that particular site. And, and really, um, it was then I just decided since we had the infrastructure and manpower in place that the, the, the remainder of the, the excavation would really be best used, um, you know, excavating that, that, that burial in its totality. Um, and I, I did have to think about it. Um, you know, it wasn't a decision that, that I took lightly by any means. Um, and I think two things really, you know, were, were overriding in terms of making that decision. First of all, the fact that, as I mentioned um, previously, is that the burial, the burial was in very sort of shallow depth. Um, it's very vulnerable to, to future ploughing and ag agricultural activity. But also when I sort of took, undertook wider research, it was clear that, you know, really when we, when we look at sort of, um, uh, you know, previously, investigated burials of this type in this stretch of the Thames. Really, you know, we're looking mainly at antiquarian, poor quality um, excavations. Um, certainly none that I can think of that have been undertaken to modern standards. So here was a, I think, a really valuable opportunity, I felt, to subject a burial of this type to, to, to you know, to very systematic, um, recording and recovery. Um, so, and I think my decision is vindicated, um, and particularly in regards to the amount of local interest that it generated, and, and it has become a really important focus for wider collaboration between the department and local groups um, in the area. And I'll talk a little bit more about this um, um, a, a bit later. But a really important spur really for building partnerships um, in the in the sort of Middle Thames East Berkshire um, region. Um, so we spent the remainder of the, the you know the campaign targeting in homing in on the burial um, itself um, and you can see here that it is at a very shallow level we're just starting to define the, the edge of the grave cut um, that slightly darker splodge which I'm hovering over was the portable antiquities scheme um, excavation to recover the bowls. Um, and what was quite interesting at quite an early stage is it, it, was, it was clear that the, the burial was covered in a layer of flint nodules. Um, you can see the burial has almost this sort of boat shape, it's almost sort of a, a boat shaped or lentoid shaped cut. 
and the upper levels of it were crammed quite tightly with flint nodules, which you can see here at the end of the excavation. This is those, um, this is those removed. So it's a clear example of an Anglo-Saxon burial, which has uh, a covering above the body. Um, but it is also possible, I mean, we'll never know this for certain, that the flints could have extended um, above ground and form some kind of a cairn or marker. Um, what's quite interesting about this burial is there's no sign of a ring ditch surrounding it. So this is not a classic case of um, a, 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 you know, a, a, an Anglo-Saxon burial on, you know, up in a prominent location marked by a barrow, um, for example, as we see with Taplow just down river from here. Um, no evidence for that at all, but nonetheless, I mean, it has all the other attributes what you might expect for a burial to be sort of prominently marked. And it's, 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 it's possible that, you know, those flints would have extended up to a higher level and been used in that way. We won't know for certain, but certainly that was a very deliberate attempt to, to seal in the remains of the, you know, the body and the, and the grave below um, the layer of flints that we were able to, to we encountered and recorded. Um, the burial is, um, you know, in terms of its orientation, um, it's north-south. And as we, uh, as, as you know, later on you'll see, you'll see um, pictures of this, but this is um, the body, the head was placed at the, at the south end. This, this, um, this burial is looking directly over the Thames Valley, um, which is quite, quite, quite interesting, in a very deliberate, a very deliberate way. Um, so the burial was quite a painstaking, excavating the burial was quite painstaking. Um, you know, both in um, respect of the, the skeletal remains, which um, are in a very fragile condition, partly because of soil conditions, partly because of plough disturbance. Um, and also we soon realised that there was quite an array of grave goods um, in the rest of the, in the unexplored portion um, of the grave. So it's quite slow going, but it provided excellent experience for um, the students especially, um, who don't often get the opportunity to, to work on archaeology of this, this particular kind. Um, so it's really valuable for them. Um, and this, well, previous to, to, you know, amongst the early uh, metal detector finds or the PAS um, excavation, um, that recovered um, a pair of spears, so it was clear that this was, this was what you call a, a weapon burial. Um, but one of the, the particularly delicate objects that we had to negotiate was what turned out to be a, a very well preserved sword in its scabbard with various scabbard fittings um, surviving. Um, and this certainly is one of the most important features of this burial. Um, and I'm very, very lucky that in terms of the analysis and conservation, um, I've got the input of somebody called Matt Bunker, who's one of the UK's leading experts on early medieval swords. Um, and he, his, his help and assistance has been, assistance has been absolutely um, crucial, really. Um, and it will enable us to, to, to really, um, you know, interpret this sword and scabbard in, 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 in a very refined way, drawing upon the conservation program and the survival of things like organics around the hilt, which, are, which I'll, I'll talk about um, in a bit more detail later. Um, so this is the, 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 this, the grave um, fully, fully excavated um, and you can see it, it's, there's not much that really survives of it. It's a very shallow. Um, you know, maximum depth really in terms of the surviving grave cut was, was, was maybe 30 centimetres at the, at the absolute, absolutely maximum. Um, you can see various um, variations in colour and soil texture there. Um, that's part of the natural variation that I talked about. Um, you've got sort of patches of, of, of naturally deposited clay with flints amongst this quite degraded um, chalk. Um, so that really brings me to the end of the first part of, of my talk. And next I'm going to move on and, and, and provide you with a sort of summary overview of the, of the contents of the burial. 
So I'm going to start with the skeletal remains, really just to, because in a sense, um, I'm only able to give you very sort of provisional um, sort of results on, on these, um, you know, based on a, a preliminary examination by Professor Mary Lewis, our osteoarchaeologist in the department at Reading. Um, she, she, we washed, washed the remains and, and, and she gave them a sort of an initial examination. Um, and based on that, um, we can say some, some, some basic things about this individual. He's most likely to be a male. I mean, I can't say that for absolute certain until further, further analysis take, has taken place. Um, it's certainly an adult, probably of middle age, maybe 30 to 40 years or so, but, but hopefully we'll be able to refine that attribution better. And the other thing that, that stood out to Mary was that this was quite a robustly built individual, as indicated by quite prominent muscle attachments, and of reasonably tall stature for the period. Um, again, we need to do further analysis to determine that more closely, but not far off six foot around that. So um, you are probably looking at a male um, of robust physique. Um, in other words, somebody in this particular case who potentially may have wielded the weapons that he was buried with. Now, the reason I say that is there's been lots of discussion um, stimulated by the research of my predecessor in the department, Heinrich Harker, on the sort of the, you know, the meaning of weapon burials like this and the fact that uh, a significant proportion um, from their pathology, from their age and so forth, were probably very unlikely to have been, uh, very unlikely they're actually warriors um, in the term, in, in the sense that we understand the term in their real lives. In other words, that, you know, this is, they're subscribing or their communities are subscribing to a, to a particular warrior, warrior ideology, which meant that it was important to bury individuals um, in this particular way. But in this particular case, um, I think there is some justification for perhaps thinking that this person was somebody that, if not, was, didn't, if not necessarily somebody engaged in warfare in the, in the, in actively in their lives, at least had the potential to. Um, I mentioned that you know much more analysis um, remains to be done on on the remains. We have a, a student dissertation, undergraduate dissertation. That's happening over the summer, um, working with Mary, looking particularly for signs. This is quite novel, actually. Um, looking for signs, um, or looking for the indications that this this individual might have spent um, quite a lot of time on horseback. Um, so that see a high status elite burial. Um, the potential is that um, you know he 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 may have spent um, time. Um, you know, on a mount and would have possessed a mount, but that's rarely considered in terms of analyses of, of early medieval burials, actually. So that's one of the things we're going to be looking into. And in parallel, um, there's going to be genetic profiling. So we've submitted samples to the Francis Crick Institute, who are going to be conduct conducting analysis on the ancient DNA. Um, and also we, get, we hope to undertake some, some isotopic analysis in-house. Um, we have Gundula Mulner, who is our, you know, our in-house um, isotopic expert. So hopefully, you know, that produced some, 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 some valuable results that will, will, will help us to sort of flesh out that very basic sketch that I've provided on the identity of this individual. So in terms of grave goods, um, this is a richly furnished grave, certainly for the period, and I'll talk more about the dating in a moment. So 24 discrete objects were placed in the grave, um, covering um, various um, themes, if you like, um, weaponry vessels, tools, personal accoutrements. And it really makes most sense to sort of take those categories in turn and, and, and to talk you through um, um, what was found in relation to those categories, starting um, with weaponry. So I've already shown you the, um, um, the spears. Um, these were placed on the right hand side of the body with the spear heads resting at the foot of the grave next to those vessels. Um, our excavation um, 
um, recovered a ferrule at the opposite end um, of one of the spears. Now, these spearheads are, are of recognized types. Um, so, so we can relate them to Swanton's typology of Anglo-Saxon spearheads. So um, fall into his, his types I2 and B2. Um, and um, the date range of those um, are, well, they fall from the fifth century into around about the first half um, of the sixth. So they're relatively closely datable, those spearhead types. Um, now obviously, um, one of the most tension grabbing um, finds from the grave is the sword in its scabbard. Um, details on that, um, the, 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 the sword has a blade that's about 98 centimeters in length, it's double-edged. We're awaiting the results of x-rays to see if it's pattern welded, but you would expect it to be. Um, I'd be very surprised um, if it isn't, you know, and, and you know, um, we expect, we expect to see quite an intricate um, pattern welded um, design. It has an H shaped um, hilt comprising a lower guard, grip and upper guard topped with an iron pommel cap. Um, the guard plates are of copper alloy sandwiching organic elements in the upper and lower guard. Um, when I say organic elements, we did actually send samples off to zooms um, and um, wood, mineralized wood um, has been preser is preserved as well, but we're waiting to hear the results of the, the specific um, identifications. Um, the scabbard um, sort so partially survives. Um, we're looking at a composite construction, leather, over wooden, um, wooden elements um, with um, metal specifically copper alloy um, decoration, including a mouth band. And I'm just hovering over it here, this U-shaped shape with simple um, incised linear decoration um, on it. And also um, some sort of composite iron copper and tinned copper alloy um, studs from the suspension mechanism. Um, so I mentioned before that, you know, we'll be able to, from these various elements, um, construct the, the, the scabbard um, and the sus associated um, sus suspension mechanism, um, you know, in, in its totality with the input of, of Matt Bunker. Now, Taking all of these various elements, the form of the hilt, the, the decorative elements of the scabbard and so forth, all those combine to suggest a date of around about the mid sixth century, um, up to, sorry, up until the mid sixth century. So in the later fifth up to the mid sixth century for the production um, of the currency of sword, swords like this. So again, it's a very helpful um, um, sort of chronological indicator. Um, moving on to those vessels, which are part of the initial discovery. So vessels of two distinctive types. So first of all, a flanged circular bowl decorated with repoussé um, on its rim. So that's this one here on the right hand side. Um, and uh, an undecorated bucket, a so-called Gockland Kessel type with a curved iron handle attached to the rim by triangular um, loops or scutcheons here. Now both these um, vessel types represent variants manufactured on the Frankish Merovingian continent during the first half of the sixth century and most probably arrived in the Th Thames Valley by way of Kent and I want you to hold on to that because that's quite significant really for the wider interpretation of this find. Also attesting Kentish connections is another type of vessel found at the head end of the grave in a very crushed condition, but a, a, a glass vessel um, representative of a, of a type of cone beaker, so-called Kempston type cone beaker. These are for later, later fifth, early sixth century date. Um, 
and most likely this series of beakers were produced um, in East Kent at um, you know, that particular period. And I'll just show you an example of a, you know, when these are found in sort of better preserved graves. I mean, they sometimes come up in a sort of a whole condition like this, but that's what we're basically looking at. Um, next category, tools and personal, personal accoutrements. Um, a pair of iron shears found up at the head end, not far from the glass vessel. In the waste region, a, a cluster of objects, including uh, an iron buckle, a striker light, um, a, a, a knife um, here, and also a pair of iron tweezers that would have been suspended um, from the waste belt. Um, Inevitably, really, with a rich, fur richly furnished burial like this, there are objects that um, don't necessarily fit neatly into functional straight typological categories, and, and this is no exception. Um, so found up at the head region of the burial were these pair of iron rings, I'll call them rings, or hoops, a D-shaped section. Um, one sli slightly smaller than the other. I guess that the larger one has a diameter of about maybe eight centimeters. Um, further research is required really to identify what these might be and I'll be very interested to hear your suggestions. So slight uncertainty surrounding what that, um, what that might relate to. Um, so that's kind of what you know, we recovered in terms of the, the, the contents of the grave. Um, the what, one or two other interesting kind of, um, you know, discoveries from the grave fill. So um, a fragment of glass, an am, a fragment of glass, a fragment of amber, you can see here, and a shirt of pottery from the grave fill that might suggest that, you know, that this does belong, originally belong to a, a cluster of burials rather than being necessarily a singleton, an isolated burial on its own. There is some background noise, in other words, that's getting incorporated into, into the fill. Um, it's equally interesting to consider what's not represented, actually. Um, and, and, and key here really is a shield. You would expect for a sort of a, a fully furnished warrior burial of this date to, 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 to find a shield. And one thinks of the parallels for this burial, which I'll talk about in a moment. Shield bosses are, are, you know, are you know, commonly represented. Um, so it's quite conspicuous by its absence. Um, there are known parallels, however, for shields being placed over graves. So it's not impossible that what, that's what happened here. Um, so that's a possibility to, to consider. Oh, sorry, the, the other thing that's shown here, a conservator picked this up um, um, from when she was cleaning the, um, the scabbard. As a, this is actually looking at a bit of a creepy crawly here. This is a scorpion. Um, it was quite interesting to, to, to inform the landowner that, um, that, that there's a bit of the, evidence for the rich ecology of his um, of his field. Um, and there you go, that's the kind of a bit of a sidelight. So just to sort of summarise, you know, what I've gone through um, so far, um, the Marlow Warlord is a, a richly furnished grave of a tall and physically opposing male, most likely, dating to the period of around about AD 475 to 530 seemingly buried in isolation or maybe as part of a very sort of defined cluster on a commanding site over offering extensive vistas over the River Thames um, and adjacent territories. And that really leads me on to, um, you know, the third part of my talk, you know, what does this all mean? Um, what kind of questions does this new discovery raise? So, really just to sort of um, sketch out some, some context for you here. Um, so we're looking at discovery that forms part or you, you know, for, for, for which the wider context is the early medieval Middle Thames, um, which is traditionally regarded as a 
a bit of a shadowy borderland between adjacent stretches of the Thames falling within what would emerge as, you know, very powerful um, Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Um, you know, the likes of worse, Merton, particularly Wessex, and the Gawisse, the, 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 the sort of the, the royal heartlands of the Gawisse up in the, in the Upper Thames. Um, Mercia subsequently was a major player um, in this particular part of the Thames, as indeed potentially was Kent. Oh, this is also a region that was potentially also um, um, contested by Kent during its supremacy um, in the sixth and earlier part um, of the seventh centuries. So the, the Middle Thames, which is traditionally taken, I guess, to be from, uh, I guess, the Goring Gap down to um, the outskirts of London, is much more poorly known in this particular period. There's less finds of this period known from this stretch. And that feeds into the conception, it has fed into the conception, that this is a bit of a, a vacuum, a strategically important vacuum, nonetheless, that is being um, you know, fought over um, by powerful neighbouring kingdoms. Um, and I guess in that sense, the, 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 the Marlow warlord was, was quite a surprising discovery. It wasn't necessarily the kind of burial that one would um, expect to find in this particular stretch, or of course, although we have to bear in mind that not far downstream from here, we do have Taplo, which demonstrates very clearly um, that, um, that, 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 that there are elite individuals of possessing incredible wealth um, in this general um, locale. Um, and certainly when um, a new news of the Marlow warlord broke, um, Taplow was often mentioned to me as being, you know, the obvious parallel. Well, it's not too surprising you found something like it, like this because, you know, not far downstream, you've got this very well known, incredibly wealthy um, burial that's, you know, not far off the status um, of Sutton Hoo. Um, and I think there's certainly a, a, an element of, of truth to that. In some respects, it, it is a, an apt parallel. Um, it's another example of what you would call a sentinel burial. It shares a similar kind of dramatic landscape location um, to Marlow. To, to, to Marlo. But um, in my mind, there was, a, there was a fairly clear distinction at the same time, because Taplow really belongs to a different world to my eyes. It's, 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 it's really, it's, if it's sixth century, it's right at the very end, if not, and, and perhaps more likely to be, to be early seventh, a, a period at which, you know, hereditary royal dynasties are really imposing themselves. And, and you know, we have the emergence of our earliest attested, historically attested um, um, kingdoms, and regional kingships. Um, Marlowe's quite a lot earlier than that, um, and things are a lot more fluid. Um, so I was, um, the, there are aspects to that, although it's, it's quite close and it shares some similarities. Um, I think that, that that parallel is not perhaps as apt as some people might like to think. And I guess that leads me on to, in terms of contextualizing this burial. I think actually, sorry, this is just, um, I might return to this at the end. I don't want to get. Um, too sidetracked on that. But I think far more apt parallels lie upstream um, in the Upper Thames region. Um, you know, the stretch between um, of the Thames, particularly between um, um, Oxford and Lechlade, but, you know, areas round Dorchester in particular. Um, the, the sort of the, the historical heartland of the Gawissa and of the, the West Saxon kingdom um, has a, a rich concentration of early, med, early medieval um, burial grounds within it. Um, some antiquarian discoveries, some more recently excavated and very well excavated 
um, examples um, in there as well, um, like Fairford um, um, being one example. Um, there are others. And these are extensive in the main, these are extensive community or folk burial grounds. In some cases, numbering hundreds um, of individual interments, displaying clear evidence for social stratification within them. So within any one community, um, one will find examples of, of an apex, if you like, of very, very richly furnished male and female um, interments. Um, and what comes through very strongly from these um, are the Kentish connections. So status is being expressed in relation to the acquisition of objects, um, particularly of personal adornment that are produced um, in Kent and acquired from Kent. And I'll show just a, a, some examples of the, the, the categories that I'm talking about, keystone, car, dark, garnet disc brooches, specific types of buckle, um, glass vessels, and so forth. Now, I think I can legitimately say this, but you could pick the Marlowe Warlord burial up. And if you were to place him in one of these communities, one of these extensive um, cemeteries that we know from the, from the Upper Thames, um, for example, Long Whittenham is, 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 is probably a good example. It would not, not look out of place at all, um, you know, from the other, you know, um, apex burials that we see from these places. The date is very similar. The range of objects is also very similar. And some of the best parallels for the, um, the, 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 the bronze vessels, for the particular type of sword and scabbard fittings um, come from these Upper Thames burials. So there's clearly close affiliations between, these in, between this particular individual um, um, and, 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 those, and the communities that, that, that lived um, in this particular um, region. Now, the Upper Thames, to anyone that, 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 that knows the early medieval archeology span of the Upper Thames, it has its own um, quite striking corpus of what you call sentinel burials um, that share very dramatic um, locations with extensive views over the Thames Basin. And again, you know, one's inclined to make comparisons between um, the Marlow Warlord and examples such as this one from this burial from Lowbury Hill um, on the sort of escarpment of the of the um, of the downs, um, so we can see immediately here it's on display in Oxfordshire Museum, very richly furnished warrior burial again, sword, spears, other object categories repeated that we're familiar with, um, bronze vessel in this case it's a hanging bowl, personal accoutrements. Um, so the suite of objects generally um, is quite similar um, to Marlowe. But again, we run into the same problem with, um, the, that we had with Taplow. All of the sentinel burials, um, these barrow burials in prominent locations found in the Upper Thames, whether it's Lowbury or whether it's Custon um, or whether it's um, um, West Hanny, um, these are considerably later in date. Um, Lowbury is probably mid to late 7th century. All the others are certainly seventh century. So again, they reflect quite different social and cultural conditions um, to, um, to the Marlow warlord. Um, so, I mean, I think for that reason, I mean, this sort of quite provisional attempt to context contextualize the burial does, um, uh, um, it does sort of present a sort of, um, you know, some quite interesting, I think it encourages us to reevaluate the tradition of sentinel burial as a particular practice um, and what the origins are. Um, Marlowe, as I've stated before, is most likely to be late fifth going into early sixth. It shows that powerful individuals in the Middle Thames region were experimenting with this particular rite 
several generations before it reaches its, flor its flurry in the later sixth, early seventh centuries. So clearly we're wrong to view in that, in light of that, the Middle Thames as a, as a vacuum. Clearly it's, um, it's an important player in that period where, um, you know, social complexity is starting to emerge and manifest itself um, in different ways. Um, and that's perhaps not too surprising because strategically the Middle Thames is absolutely you know, critical in terms of sort of guarding that corridor between you know, the Upper Thames, the, the heartlands of the Dewis and Kent. Um, and that connection was vitally important to communities um, you know, of, the, of, of the Thames region generally in this period. So it's perhaps not too surprising, but you know, I think it's a really important discovery perhaps for putting, to, to re-evaluating the significance of the Middle Thames and its role. And I guess that sort of takes me back to this slide here. And that's what we're really trying to do. Um, this is still very sort of in its very early stages, but um, as a project, but the department is collaborating with a number of local um, groups, heritage organizations, stakeholders in the Middle Thames area in, in, in a project called the Middle Thames Archaeological Partnership, really just to put this part of the Thames on the map, sort of place it um, more on the map. Um, you know, its archaeology generally is much less known, well known than neighboring stretches of the Thames. Um, some of that is, 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 is perhaps genuine. There's just less to discover. There's some reasons, archeological reasons for that. But also I just think it's seen less research um, than, those re than, than, than those regions. And there's, there's real opportunities here for um, enhancing um, the archeological heritage and deploying it um, for benefit of local communities. And I think the Marlow Warlord has really, really acted as a, as a, as a fantastic spur to, towards building this partnership and making um, and, you know, exploiting the archaeological resource for the Middle Thames um, more fully. So I think I'm going to I'm just going to sort of end on that positive note. And the, there's there's the socially distanced and spaced team at the end of the at the end of the, the project back in. Um, summer 2020 so thanks very much for for hearing me out and uh hand hand you handing over for questions happy to hand over for questions yeah but thank you very very much that was uh, that was fantastic basically um and we're all missing archaeology we're all missing our holes in the ground um Yes, we will have some questions if, if, if you're uh, happy to take some. We've had some come through already. Um, there's a point that Sally Thompson has made that there's no shield at the Lowbury Hill burial either. Is that the case? Um, is that not a shield boss? I have thought it had a, one of these sugarloaf shield bosses, the uh, distinctive seventh century type, but I might be wrong. I might Actually, have to, like to comment on that, Sally. <laughs> I might, I might, I might have to go sort of double check that, but that but would be interesting. But it's interesting to know that there are others within yeah. uh, within the south of England that do display that potentially shield on top of the the burial um, type yeah. setup. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for noting that for me, and I'll definitely explore that further because yes, that'll be really interesting if that's that, if that's the same at Lowbury. If it's the same at Lowbury. Uh, coming to your iron rings, um, a couple of people have mentioned, Roland mentioned, uh, could the iron rings be binding for a textile or wooden container that hasn't survived? Yeah. Um, it's interesting you mentioned the textile because presumably there's no evidence of, of what could have been held by those rings. And in fact, there's a secondary question to that, I think, mm. because Margaret Broomfield has asked, is there any, any evidence for food remains or residues? Mm. Yeah, um, you know, taking the first part of that question, I, I mean, I, I like that. I mean, that's my hunch that they are binding strips for either a wooden or a textile container. 
Um, I need to speak to my conservator. If it was textile, you might expect some minimal um, preservation replacement from the textile container to survive mm. and be picked up. So that's something we'll look for carefully. Um, but my money's on it being a, a container of some kind. Um, so thanks for that. that. That's kind of, it's good to know other people are sort of thinking in, in, in the same way. Food remains, um, nothing was um, picked up in terms of, you know, in, during the conservation of the bowls. I mean, they were block lifted um, and, you know, they were, you know, conserved to an incredibly high standard and that wasn't, that wasn't noted. But a good point, because I know that you do get remains, organic sort of food remains from other vessels from, from early medieval burials, hanging bowls and things like that, if I'm not mistaken. So that's certainly a very apt question, but I don't think in this case the evidence survives, unfortunately. Right. Okay, what else we got uh, Wood we here? There's lots of people saying thank you very much, by the way. One of the problems with Zoom yeah, and we're, we're all doing it as we miss the applause. Everyone likes a good rousing clap at the end of a talk and none yeah. of us have been able to have that for, for months. I, I know months. what you mean. I, I have to, in my, in, my, in my role, I have to organise quite a lot of sort of talks and it, and it is really quite frustrating that you can't yeah. do that. Um, someone's asked uh, about the position of the head. I mean, you talked mm. about the alignment, the north-south alignment. Does that position suggest anything with oh, other parallels, for instance? Thanks for that really interesting question. It's really prompted me to, to sort of explain this a bit more fully. I, I, I neglected to say it in my talk. But um, yeah, the, 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 the position of the, 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 the deceased was very, very deliberate. Um, so as I mentioned previously, his head was positioned and it was propped up slightly facing north, looking over the, the Thames Valley. Um, I mean, apparently uh, on, on researching this, this is, this is relatively common, but his, his um, right arm was crossed over his body and his hand was placed over the hilt of his sword, um, you know, almost like ready for action, you know, in the, in the you know, as, you know, on entering the, the, the other world, if you like. Um, so a very clear, and quite an active body position, if you like, um, that, that kind of, you know, shows the, the care that was taken um, in terms of this individual's placement. And I guess the other thing that, that I, I didn't mention that's worth highlighting is they're very, very poorly recorded, but we know that there are burial grounds of the same or similar date down in the valley bottom, which is where we presume that the contemporary settlements were located. Um, so, you know, the, the part of the deliberate nature of this burial is that this individual was not being interred within the sort of the communi community burial grounds. Um, it was deliberately being removed from that context and buried apart in that isolated position, which all sort of really, you know, adds to the impression that this was a, an important individual, potentially, a, you know, a, a leader of a, of, a, of a local community who occupied that territory. And I think the burial is making very clear and overt statements of territory. Um, and lineage in where it's buried and how it's buried and, and that the positioning of the burial really, I think. I think and, and are there other precedents for that sort of, uh, that sort of thinking in the south, yeah. in, 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 the, in the upper Thames Valley, for instance? Yeah, yeah I think, I think you, that there's, there are, there are other, so not necessarily a, a precisely the same date because, you know, as I mentioned, the sentinel burials of the upper Thames tend to be somewhat later. Um, and that's interesting. This separation is quite unusual because I said previously, you know, the, 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 the burials of this type, when you find them in the upper Thames, they're within the, you know, within wider cemeteries. Um, so that, that, that yeah. statements aren't being made, in, those messages aren't being made in quite the same way. And that may be something to do with the fact that this is territorially slightly different. It perhaps there's a different sort of, perhaps who knows, we'll have to be interested to see what the results of the DNA and 
um, isotopes show, but this may be different cult cultural ethnic composition to the communities living in the Middle Thames who live that much closer to British enclaves, just on the Chilterns, just across the river. Um, so, you know, I, I, th I think we have to allow for, for there to be quite a lot of diversity if you take the Thames more broadly in the way that burial is being used to express and signal identity. Right. Okay, a couple of specific questions here. Um, your dating appears to be very heavily based on typologies. Um, and there's a lot of bone there. Carbon dating? I wish it was that simple. Unfortunately, <laughs> we're at the wrong point of the calibration curve. Right. If it was if it was late sixth, seventh, I would say it would be worth doing. Yeah. Because the calibration curve is much better for that period. But we've got enough of a, a handle on the on the general dating from typology to show that it wouldn't be worthwhile because of where we are on the calibration yeah. curve. It's hopeless for yeah. the earlier sixth, late fifth, earlier sixth century. It's really, really okay. not worth it. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's, there's a general question being uh, asked in here about uh, publication and those artifacts. Uh, what's going to happen to um, the evidence, shall we say? I, I know they're going to be put in museums or what have you, but... Uh... As I said, the final destination for the, for, 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 the, for the skeletal remains and the objects will be Buckinghamshire Museum, Aylesbury. Yeah. Um, having said that, we do hope to... I mean, this was all completely, um, we were planning to hold a temporary exhibition of the remains in Maidenhead, a local exhibition, but that was all thrown off by, thrown off by COVID. But that's something that we definitely want to do in the future. So, you know, just to, because it has that real local interest. Yeah. Um, so certainly for the benefit of, of, of local audiences, that's something we'll do. Um, there will be an academic um, publication emerging from um, from this discovery. Um, you know, probably won't. You know, it's not sufficient to qualify for a, for a monograph or anything of that that length. But certainly, a, a, an academic art, article in something like medieval archaeology that really can, you know sort of brings all the strands together and contextualizes the find. Right. Okay. Um... Perhaps one more question, which is, uh, there's two here actually, that's slightly related. Someone's actually asked about cuts on the bone. Um, and I think that that probably relates to another question, which is, is there an indication of the cause of death? So, you know, is this a result of um, a, a bad night at the pub? <laughs> um, good questions. Um, yeah, ultimately I can't answer that now until we've done the really fine grained analysis of the skeletal remains which yeah. is which is pending but um you know it's possible we might recover evidence for pathology whether those pathologies relate to cause of death is quite another thing um the dna profiling might bring out some interesting results in relation to um you know health and chronic conditions also right so watch this space okay that's <laughs> that's a fair summary all right. Um, well, we won't hold you up anymore. Um, thank you for an extremely interesting evening. I'm going to ask uh, Claire to come back in, uh, if she would, unmute herself. Oh, there she is. Um, so I will thank you and hand over to Claire and uh, to thank everyone else that came this evening as well and have a safe journey home. So uh, thanks very much indeed from me. So before I start, I just want to say thank you to Chris. Um, without his help on tech and communications, there's absolutely no way we'd be able to do any of this. So thank you very much. I did have one question. Um, Gabor, will you be returning at all to the location? Um, is there any further work that you think you need to do? Good question. Um, I don't think um, um, I will be returning to the site um, certainly anytime soon. Um, I think we did enough to establish that this is likely to be either an isolated burial or part of a defined cluster that, uh, and if there was a defined cluster, I think the likelihood is those have been, you know, disturbed by the plow and, and probably no longer, I don't think there's likely to be in situ remains. And it's also the case that, you know, this is, this is quite intensively used farmland. So there's just mm. logistical problems. I'm um, doing further work there. But having said that, under the umbrella, umbrella of the Middle Thames partnership, 
there are plans for some really exciting field work. I don't want to um, sort of give away any 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 secrets to the uh, presently on this, but there are some really 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 fascinating early medieval um, sites in that general stretch, and a, a couple of which I've got my eye on. So you'll hear okay. more. There's a nice well not that far away, so to see what happens with that. So, okay, um, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, just to finalise, I, I have four observations. I'm, I'm, the first one is, I can't imagine how Sue Washington was thinking as the metal detectorist as she found the bowls. It must have been all her Christmases at once. It mm. must have been amazing. Mm. Um, the other one is, uh, I can't believe how shallow uh, your grave cut was. I did actually dig out my ruler. That's actually how deep you were. That's it, 30 mm. centimeters. That's un, un, that's incredible. Uh, mm. You are so lucky to have found it and then been able to um, to dig, dig it. So um, that's amazing. Um, my third observation is uh, maybe a bit tongue in cheek, but I've never heard my hometown uh, been described as a strategically important vacuum before, but um, I think, <laughs> you, I think you've managed a... <laughs> yeah yeah just actually that doesn't make sense does it <laughs> <laughs> yes all right so you redeemed yourself no, no, no problems at all but, but my final thing it really is um how important this this site is because of its early aging and you know for me that's even in in comparison to taplo that actually that's that's something that's really really important i look forward to hearing a lot more about it um so just in, in wrapping everything up, I just, I do want to say thank you to you, Gabor, for giving up your time to talk to us. And that's from yeah. all of the attendees and also from CBA Wessex. Thank you very much. I can clap and you can hear me clapping. Yeah. I'm sure everybody else is as well. Thank you. Great. Thanks loads, Claire. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Bye.